Well, this is your first Sunday with us. Uh, one thing that you need to know is we're actually a, a network of churches in the Atlanta area or a family of churches in the Atlanta area. And today there are three of us that are coming together uh, to start this series called Voices. So I wanted to give a special hello and welcome to my friends at Buckhead Church and at Gwinnett Church. If, uh, my name is Evan. I'm one of the uh, pastors for North Point Ministries. And we are so glad that uh, we're all together today because this is going to be a fantastic experience. And my hope is at this point, um, whether you're at Buckhead or Gwinnett Church or here at North Point here in the East or the West or online, could we please give a very warm welcome to our speaker today, Jeremy Cowart. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Good morning. morning. It's great, great to be here with you guys this morning in person and online as well and at the other campuses. Uh, first service, I did not have my family with me, but this morning, this service, they're all here. So uh, at the very end, they don't know this, but I'm actually going to let them come up and wave to y'all. And my kids think it's super cool to be on stage with me, so for a second, they're gonna come up and wave at everybody. But um, we just drove in late last night from Nashville. I uh, am a photographer and an artist, and I work alone in a studio well, me and my golden retriever. And so it's uh, fun to be here with you all this morning. Um, so as I just said, I'm not usually a speaker, and I realized yesterday as I was getting ready for this trip, I don't even have speaker pants. So I'm wearing my, my ninja pants. So... Uh, <laughs> Uh, I asked him, I was like, can I borrow Andy's speaker pants? And they were like, no, nah, that'll probably be weird, so I'm here in my, my ninja pants. Uh, but no, it's great to be with y'all. Uh, I'm a graphic, former graphic designer, so I drew my story, and I'm about to share that with y'all. But before I do that, I want everybody to um, maybe just close your eyes for a minute, and I want y'all to think of and identify something in your life that you would love to do, you've always wanted to do, but you've resorted to the words, I can't. Maybe it's a relationship you want to reconcile. Maybe it's a, a financial goal. Maybe it's a hobby. Maybe it's a career. Maybe it's a, it could be anything. Just something in your life that you just, you've, you've given in to the words, I can't. You can open your eyes once you've identified that. I just want you all to kind of keep in mind that thing as I share my story, because I've certainly had lots of those. And so uh, with that being said, we'll, we'll dive in. So as I said, my name is Jeremy, and this is my story. I was born in Nashville, Tennessee. I grew up in a suburb of Nashville called Hendersonville. Hendersonville was originally known for being the hometown to Mr. Johnny Cash, but now it's known for being the hometown to Miss Taylor Swift. I love you, Taylor. I do. <laughs> so growing up, I was never smart. I couldn't pay attention for more than three minutes. I was a terrible listener, and I made bad grades. I was quiet, shy, and really just average. I always remember telling my mom and dad, I can't do this. So that's when my dad started reprogramming my brain. He reprogrammed it with one simple sentence. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He said this for years, over and over and over again. And then in seventh grade, I discovered I could draw, so I started taking art a little more seriously. Something came alive in me whenever I would create so here I was failing miserably at all the mandatory academics, but I came to life in the optional arts. Heck, I was even tested with some fancy aptitude tests my senior year in high school, and here were my official results. The inductive reasoning, I got a 15 out of 100. Analytical reasoning, I got a five out of 100. Structural visualization, another 15. Uh, let's see, observation, 15. My English vocabulary was a five out of 100. Killing it, killing it. Pretty sure it's still a five. So, uh, perfect. It's now been confirmed that I'm a complete and total moron. Thank you, Aptitude Test, for that. That's me photoshopped on Bill Gates' face body, by the way. Uh, so when it came time for college, all I knew was art. I could make pretty things, and that was about it. So I wanted to be a painter for the rest of my life. So my parents made a call that was very wise, and in hindsight, way ahead of their time. My mom said, it's going to be tough to make a living as a painter. You should look into computers and graphic design instead. Whoa, here comes those two words again. I can't. Computers are for smart people. Computers are for people who can focus. I'm not smart, so therefore, I can't. 
You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you, they reminded me. So off to the races, I went ahead and reluctantly jumped in. And guess what happened? I fell in love. Turns out that Photoshop is the coolest tool on the planet. And it's not just for anybody. It's uh, not just for smart people, it's for anybody. It's definitely for me. So I studied graphic design in college and I got my first job at a high-end ad agency. And after a year, my boss fired me. Not only did he fire me, but he suggested that I find another career altogether. So thanks, boss. <laughs> but see, he was too late. I had already started believing that I could do anything I wanted to do. So thankfully, I ignored him, and I worked for a couple more ad agencies. And then I finally realized that that world for me was boring because I was designing websites for air conditioning companies. And it's literally impossible to make an AC unit look sexy. <laughs> So at the time, I had a few friends doing music. I knew how to design album covers, websites. Why not work for my friends instead? So after having the idea, I quit my comfortable job the next day. I didn't think, I just jumped. I called the company Pixel Grazer and it took off. Uh, album covers, websites, merch, we were doing all kinds of stuff. But one day a friend said, hey, you should buy this new thing called a digital camera. Here we go again, back to square one. I can't. There's no way. Photography, I thought, is for smart people. I took one photography class in college and I made a D. And my professor seemed to hate me, so I swore off photography for life. I literally told my friends I will never become a photographer. So what did I do? I went to the bookstore and bought a book called Digital Photography for Dummies. <laughs> I really did, true story. <laughs> I learned about these scary things called f-stops, shutter speeds, white balance, and more. And to my utter surprise, I actually understood it all. So maybe I wasn't an idiot after all. So I went and bought a whopping three megapixel camera and was ready to take over the world. Next thing you know, I was shooting those musician friends of mine for fun and I wasn't awful. So I finally told all my design clients, hey, I'm taking pictures now too. And you know what happened? I started landing a lot of gigs. One of those gigs was for a record label, and I ended up beating a well-known Hollywood agent and her roster of celebrity photographers. So she calls me and she said, hey, I'd love to represent you. Your work is amazing. By the way, you know how to light sets, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, totally, sure. But I had never lit a big set before. So we signed a deal within weeks. I was shooting for TV networks like E! and Fox, and I got to shoot this up-and-comer named Sting. It's crazy. So the immediate success was shocking. I went from amateur photographer to celebrity photographer in just a few months. Since then, I photographed a long list of celebrities. The Kardashians, Ryan Seacrest, Taylor Swift, Kelly Clarkson, Carrie Underwood, Gwyneth Paltrow, and many, many more. I've now published four photography books, uh, I toured the country as Britney Spears tour photographer, long story. Uh, I got to photograph Obama on the first day of his presidency. I got to document the Pope's journey to the U.S. last year, apparently just the back of his head. Uh, I've, uh, my photos have now been published in Sports Illustrated, ESPN, Rolling Stone, Vanity Fair, all the major magazines I could have dreamed of. And across uh, the internet on social media, I've got uh, garnered a large following on, on the social platforms. July of 2015, Adweek named me one of 10 visual artists who are changing the way we see the world. And then in 2014, at the time, Huffington Post named me the most influential photographer on the internet. So I did it, I thought. I made it. <laughs> but wait, so what? Who cares, right? Was being a photography rock star really my goal? I realized that I shouldn't aim for greatness and stop there because greatness should serve a greater purpose. So what was my greater purpose? So that led me to the idea of giving photos away to people in need. And so I gathered together a few photography friends and we spent the day at a gym doing just that, giving photos away to people in need. So I put a simple video of the day on Facebook and various blogs and people said, hey, I want to be a part of this if you do it again, and that's when I had the thought. What if this was a global event where photographers did this all over the world? No way, I can't. Global? You see that idea that my parents instilled in me not only helped me overcome my challenges and insecurities, 
but it blew off my limitations and opened up the world to me. So why not start a global movement? Nine months later, I put the idea out there and word spread fast. Uh, so what happened that December of 2009? 3,400 photographers and 5,000 volunteers responded and we gave away 41,000 portraits, 543 locations in 42 countries around the world. Since then, the number is now, thank you, since then, our number is now approaching 100,000 people that have given away nearly half a million portraits in 70 countries in every American state. But it's not the numbers that necessarily count, it's the stories. Dignity, beauty, and value, a sense of self-worth, these are all the things being given away that material possessions can't really deliver. We've seen grown women have their hair and makeup done for the first time. We've seen men have their first pictures taken outside of their jail mug shots. We've restored photos after natural disasters. We've seen kids see their own faces for the first time in third world countries. We've had people get jobs using their new headshots to, to land a new career. We've had photographers say, this is the greatest thing I've ever done with my camera. We've had photography competitors become community after serving together. The Help Portrait was a crazy simple idea that has now reached around the world. And it made me realize that a simple idea and a camera could go a long way. So how else could I help? So when the earthquake struck Haiti, I was dumbfounded. Couldn't believe my eyes. But more importantly, couldn't believe what the media was saying about it all. They just kept mentioning how many buildings had fallen, how many people died. It was all stats. But what, what about the people? What about their stories, I wondered. So as I sat on my couch watching TV, I wondered what if they could tweet? What would they say to the world right now? So as I, I uh, sorry, most of them couldn't tweet, so I went down there myself and gave them a microphone in the form of a photograph. So we went around asking people what they had to tell the world, and the results were staggering, heart-wrenching, beautiful, and inspiring. This man said, my chopped leg is not the problem. The lack of government is the problem. This lady simply said, oh, the things I've seen. This man said, the earth may shake, but Haiti remains in my heart. This woman said, God, please show me the path of hope. But somebody had hope, we heard there was a wedding going on and that thought was crazy because there were still aftershocks happening. There were literally dead bodies laying around Haiti. The thought was crazy. Who in their right mind would get married amongst all this devastation? So we found the wedding and we asked them what they had to say to the world and their response blew us away. They found the only paper plate on the ground and they wrote on it, love conquers all. So a couple years later, I decided to go to Uganda with my friends at Exile International, but this time I wanted to collaborate with children, specifically former child soldiers who had been abducted by Joseph Kony in the Lord's Resistance Army. As a form of art therapy, we worked together to tell their stories. We interviewed them, I took pictures of them, and we had them draw the pains of their past and the dreams of their future. I even taught them how to draw their stories in Photoshop. And the stories weighed heavy on our team. One girl was forced to participate in the murder of her own mother. Then there was, she was seven years old at the time. Then there was Dillish. Dillish had finished her art. She said, wait, I need to draw more. She said, they killed my mother in front of me and my baby sister. And my sister started crying, so they picked her up by the feet and they slammed her body into a tree to also kill her. And this is Dillish's actual art that she drew to tell the story. So this is the, the soldiers, the, the camouflage, the guns. Um, she needed to get this out as a process of her therapy. Other stories were even more graphic, more horrific and evil to recount here today. But all of them had glimpses of hope and redemption woven throughout. And I wanted to help show that. 
So I take their stories, their portraits, their art, and I combine them all together in the computer to make these uh, mixed media pieces of art. So then the final piece is I actually print in my studio and then I draw on top of them to continue this collaboration between me and these kids. And then we uh, sell them online at exileinternational.org slash posa. And that raises more money for their continued art therapy. 100% of the money goes back to them. So speaking of kids, my wife Shannon, who's here, uh, we have two biological children. We adopted two more children from Haiti as well. They're all here today. And you know what I tell them all the time? Philippians 4.13. Adoption's one of the hardest things we've ever done, but also the most rewarding. My two older children have welcomed their new siblings with open arms. And our new children are always overcoming language and cultural barriers while learning to embrace life in an entirely new environment. And every day they're all reminding me what a lived what it means to live out the idea that it took me so long to embrace. And nothing is more important to me than family. And not only I have two supportive parents, but I have two older brothers as well. A few years ago, we took our daughters to a daddy-daughter dance. That night, Mike, my brother, also a photographer, took just one photo of me and my daughter that night. In return is a little challenge. I took just one photo of he and his daughter, Reese, as well. Fast forward a few weeks, I was speaking at a conference in Vegas when I got a 911 text from my dad. He called me and said, Mike just suddenly passed away of a heart attack. He was 43 years old and none of us had any idea there was anything wrong. And that night at the daddy-daughter dance was the last time I took his picture and one of the last times I saw him alive. So in the weeks and months that followed his passing, I began asking, what if I died tomorrow? What about my kids? What if I could teach them everything I've learned in life just in case? Because see, we live in an age where it's really easy to document our thoughts and our feelings, but why don't we document our wisdom? Could you imagine if your grandparents and great-grandparents would have had the technology we have now and they just would have taught you and documented everything they knew how to do. We're the beginning of our digital family trees. Five generations from now, your family will be Googling you. They'll be reading your Facebook post, your Instagram, your tweets, your snaps, everything. Isn't that scary? <laughs> so what are you saying and teaching them right now? That line of thinking inspired me to kind of launch something called C University, where I, I as soon as I think about something that I've learned in life, I just teach it, whether it's photography or lighting or fear of failure, business, marriage work, balance. Like, I just document stuff. It's for the world, but really, at the end of the day, it's for my children, because one day they'll, they'll, I'll be able to pass my knowledge to them. So think about that. Little shy, fifth percent on me from Hendersonville, Tennessee, and I'm now teaching the world about the very things in life that I thought I couldn't do. So now you know what I've done with my time here on earth. So what about my future? Well, the truth is there's another idea that I had a few years ago that I've been truly terrified of. It's my Mount Everest. It's my Goliath. It's bigger than everything I just shared. The dream is I want to build a hotel called the Purpose Hotel. Not just a hotel, but an actual global hotel chain. See, this hotel would hopefully change the world. Every room in the building is going to sponsor a child and tell their story. The internet fee will fight human trafficking through IJM. Room keys will be connected to the giving keys, which employ the homeless. There will be a charity water well in the lobby that teaches about clean water. The soap, the linens, the furniture, the design, everything in the building would be connected to a cause or a nonprofit. 
Hopefully there's gonna be uh, unparalleled creativity throughout this building. By staying in this hotel, you would be uh, affecting lives locally, domestically, and internationally. By staying at this hotel, you'll be changing the world in your sleep. This hotel is going to be built for the world, by the world. In fact, we just finished a Kickstarter online where we raised almost 700 grand to get the ball rolling, start the process, which we're now in, which is incredible. But everything's getting so much darker, right? Terrorism, war, hunger, disease, poverty, politics. It's just crazy. But Franklin Buechner said, Purpose is where deep gladness meets the world's needs. The question is when, and I believe the time is now. So join me in this crazy journey of building the Purpose Hotel. You can go to our website, thepurposehotel.com, sign up for our mailing list, or today you can actually text Purpose Hotel to 44222. That will just get you on our mailing list to stay informed about what's going on. So do you see what I just did over the last two minutes? I took the first step by speaking my dreams and fears publicly to you. There's nothing that exists yet about the hotel except for the idea itself. But this is how ideas become reality. You have to take that first step. You have to speak your dreams into existence. So text, email, call somebody today. Tell them what your dream is, what you want to do. If I can do all this, just imagine what you can do. What has kept you, I'm sorry, what what have you been too afraid to try? What voices have kept you from reaching your potential? What voices have closed your sense of wonder? If you're alive, if you're breathing, we need you. We need your vision. Remember, the word impossible actually spells I'm possible. So as you guys now know, you can do anything through Christ who strengthens you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Come on, guys. Wave. Wave, guys. Thank you. 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 Thank you so, so much, Jeremy. Never have I wanted to be more a part of someone's family than right then. <laughs> it's like, I'll just stay over there. I was going to sneak in. It's pretty cool to be on stage with you, too. Uh, hey, thank you so much for being here, Jeremy, and on behalf and for your family, and on behalf of Buckhead Church and Gwinnett Church, we are so honored that, that you chose to spend the hour with us. Thank you. It was awesome. Um, So at the beginning of Jeremy's talk, he asked all of us to close our eyes and to think through, what is that thing that's telling you, I can't, the impossible? Um, I don't know what that is for you, and and I don't know where a message like this lands. Um, But I will say that for, uh, for us, we, as a group of churches, we wanna be a place where you can find somebody to share your I can't with. The thing that, that uh, you would say is impossible, we wanna be a place to begin a conversation around this. At all of our churches, you just need to check in with one of our guest services volunteers we'll be more than happy to direct you in the right place. Um, we do believe uh, that that statement is so powerful that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Like, we think that is so powerful, but at the same time, we recognize that that could be, uh, lead you to a question, It could lead you to frustration, um, and we would hate for you to walk away and spend a week wrestling with that. We would love to to engage with you. We believe that the church ought to be the safest and best place to have a conversation around your can't and your impossible. Before we leave today, uh, I would love just to pray with all of us at Buckhead and Gwinnett as well. So would you bow your heads with me? (sighs) Heavenly Father, um, thank you so much for today. Uh, Thank you for Jeremy and his beautiful family, uh, for what uh, you're doing in him and through him. Father, for the voice that he has become uh, for our world. (laughs) Father, for his parents and the voice that they were for him. We just say thank you. 
And Father, for the men and women who are in this room right now, and you've given them a voice to speak life into other people, Father, I pray that you would encourage them, uh, that you would move them, that you would raise the awareness of the importance of their voice. And Father, for, for those in the room that are just wrestling with, I can't, it's impossible, we're stuck, or I pray you would meet us there, and that you would provide us a place to talk about it, a place to express it. And Father, we are so grateful uh, that nothing is impossible for you and that, that you did something extraordinary on our behalf when you sent your son Jesus as your voice, as your expression here on earth. Father, we thank you for that. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.